Thomas, in response to the Duke of Norfolk's question, why don't you offer, why don't you join us for fellowship and just take the oath, Thomas says, when we die, we stand before God, and we are judged, and you are sent to paradise for following your conscience, and I am damned for not following mine. Will you join me for fellowship? And uh, what does Meg ask her father to do? And it was a stable daughter, a good Latinist, as we saw. She responds in Latin to King Henry VIII. Uh, Thomas More believed in educating both sons and daughters. And it was against the custom at the time. And uh, Meg tries to persuade him to take the oath. Just say it. You don't have to mean it. You say it. Just say it. Just say it, that you're okay. I take the oath, even though you know you're, you're not intending it. But what does Thomas say? Her, her father. He said, "When you take an oath, it's like holding what? Remember your hands? It's like holding your heart in your hands or water in your hands and." And um, you can't just let it run through your fingers. Um, it would be inauthentic. It would be a lie to just to say the oath and not mean it. And then it would be scandalous, too, because everyone was looking at him. All of Europe that knew that he was on, on the grill, so to speak, uh, because he was not taking the oath of fidelity to Henry VIII. His lust moved him to proclaim, proclaim himself as the king of England. Or the, the king of England, the, uh, the head of the church in England. Okay. So, I'm uh, going to move on to uh, another topic here. Actually, we touched on it the other day, especially with this question. About medical treatments and what are the church's moral principles. You can never do evil. First principle of morality, do good and avoid evil. Second, you can't do evil to retain good. You can't use e an evil means to attain a good end, in other words. And those principles apply to health care, the meaning of Christian suffering. That's what we're going to review today. Okay. Some basic principles, first of all. When we look at considering Catholic health, it's a big issue, especially with the new health care law, which uh, actually does provide for death families, in a sense. Individuals coming in and making decisions to, to take away treatment from people. And um, the basic principle we go on is human life is a gift from God. Only God has a right to determine when life begins or when it ends. We do not have a right to die. We don't have a right to end our lives. We determine when we will end our lives. That's, that is for God to determine. God has a time and a man plan for us. Rather, we are stewards of our lives. And we have, I quote here, the right and the duty in case of serious illness to take the necessary treatment for the preservation of life and health. That was Pope Pius XII who spoke those words back you know, more than 50 years ago. In the talk he gave to anesthesiologists. And there is always a presumption in favor of life. If a means is necessary or useful to preserve life, for health, we ordinarily must use it. Now, here's where things get uh, a little more complicated, okay? We are obligated to receive ourselves or to give to others. If you're a, sometimes people will appoint, may appoint us as a power of attorney. Okay, if I'm not able to make a decision, you make it for me. You have to know what the teaching is. That's why we're going over this, okay? Uh, or if you're a, a medical professional, doctor or nurse, okay, we're obligated to receive ourselves or give to others ordinary means of preserving human life. 
ordinary medical care. Ordinary means just what is determined by the present state of medicine. For example, performing a routine operation, administering a commonly used medicine. That's ordinary. We're obligated to receive it or give it to someone else. Basic rule number two, but normally neither the patient nor the physician is obligated to use extraordinary means of preserving life if this means is shown to be excessively burdensome, if it's just costing a lot of money, and um, say prolonged suffering. The person's just prolonging suffering. You're at the end of life. Okay? We, can, we can use these extraordinary means to preserve your life for, for you know, a few more months. And the person's in, you know, dying of cancer. No, no, you can just, I, I don't want this extraordinary means. Or it can pose, can pose a significant disproportion between treatment and benefits. Again, you know, someone who's just is going to continue suffering pain at the end of his or her life. So you don't have to use an extraordinary means to keep someone alive. Someone is, has cancer all over. Well, we can, we can go in and open them up and, and uh, take their cancer out. They're, they're, they're 90 years old, and um, this is not going to prolong their life very long. People can say, no, I don't want this. My grandmother, the doctor, wanted to, do, to go in and, and, and operate on her. And he said, no. And she said, no. You know, I'm, I'm 86 years old. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to you know, depart life. And you know, what are you going to give me? A few more months to live? If you come in and, and do you know, an operation of cancer that's very expensive, that's very painful, it's even doubtful I'll make it through the operation? No, you know, I, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. So, um, however, in some cases, extraordinary measures should be used. For example, you know, a young child who would ordinarily use an extraordinary means to keep someone alive. They need a special operation. Well, usually you'll do it. Most of these cases we're talking about, uh, they concern, uh, they concern, uh, you know, people, you know, at, at the end of life decisions. That's when this usually comes up. If, if uh, a newborn child needs some expensive operation, usually we'll do the operation, even though it's, it could be termed extraordinary, it's out of the ordinary, but we would ordinarily give that treatment to a, a newborn child or a little child in order to preserve their life. Basic rule number three, uh, this is an important one. Food and water that is nutrition and hydration, even by artificial means, a feeding tube, are not medical care. These are considered basic human care, it must always be administered to patients unless death is imminent, say for the day, or the person's body is not benefiting. With putting you know, food and water and it's not doing anything because the body is broken down. Well, people often have a, a fear today of a feeding tube. And I, I want to make it clear that feeding tube is not extraordinary. It's, it's not something that's unduly burdensome. I used to feed people before the, the feeding tubes we got became more popular. When I was in the seminary, that was one of my um, apostolates for one year. I went out and I fed people, elderly, you know, sometimes Alzheimer patients or people very ill. I, my, I and other seminarians went and fed them. Feeding someone, has anyone ever fed someone, an elderly person? have food in front of them, you spoon feed them. It's, uh, it's time consuming. And um, you know, people, people can stay alive this way, of course. You, you feed them you know, with, with you know, a spoon or a fork, give them a little bit, and it's, it's, it's not something that's burdensome to them, not something that's painful to them. But sometimes the, their ability to swallow in the elderly, especially if they undergo an operation and they come out of it, they lose the ability to swallow. There's a friend of our family, she's in her 90s now, uh, about six or seven years ago. She had a series of operations, didn't know if she'd make it through. She lost the ability to swallow. And they put in a feeding tube, uh, a GI tube, gastrointestinal. Uh, they make a simple incision, they inject a tube, and you, you, you pour in shore, or some like, pre-made uh, mix, uh, health drink or something. Into the, into the tube, and the person is, is fed. It's very simple. 
It's, it's not a burden. It's more of a burden to sit there and feed people. Believe me, I've done it. But that's not unduly burdensome to have someone feeding someone. Uh, and, and to put in a, a tube in order to feed someone is, is part of ordinary care. It's, it's part of basic human care. It's not even medical care. Even to do it by artificial means, like a tube. And the person, this friend of my family, her name is Alice, uh, she actually, little by little, gained the ability back to swallow. And some of some people and the medical staff were saying, well, just you know, let her let her die, basically. We don't have to give her a feeding tube. And people said, no, no, just give her a feeding tube, make a little incision, and she came back to life. She's she's able to eat now. Now that she has, uh, over time, gained that ability back, she doesn't need feeding tube anymore. So we uh, we always give food and water. In fact, I just learned this because. There are directives by our bishops to uh, have people sign. When you go into a hospital now to get treatment, you have to sign an advanced directive. You have to have one on file usually. Okay? Uh, they want this, in case something should happen, okay, what do you want done or not done? Some people you know, who don't go by Catholic health care principles, you know, I, I wouldn't want any uh, treatment uh, at all, if I'm going to die, just leave me die. Well, to, to say, to say, to sign up something like a living will, where uh, you say, I don't want any treatment, even extraordinary, you don't know, you may want extraordinary treatment. There may be cases where, where you're, you have the ability to live for another 30 years, you need an extraordinary treatment. To make a decision beforehand and say, I don't want any, is, is wrong from a Catholic perspective. So we don't want to be signing uh, documents saying, I don't want any extraordinary treatment. <clears throat> um, because we don't know what our situation may be. And um, uh, especially we don't want to deny ourselves food and water. Uh, I learned from, from looking at a new document from the bishops that they're encouraging people to sign beforehand and, and advance directive is called. We're going to tell people, so assign someone as a power of attorney to make decisions for me if I'm, if I'm um, unable to make a decision. But it goes by Catholic principles that that uh, food and, and water will not be withdrawn from you. And what I learned is that's it's actually the law of the state of Wisconsin that food and water uh, administered manually can't be denied someone. That's the law of the state. If someone needs food and water, you just can't say, we're not going to feed them and, and let them die. The state of Wisconsin prohibits that. What it doesn't prohibit is, is uh, uh, refusing uh, feeding through a tube. But as Catholics, we say, no, if someone needs feeding through a tube, you do that. Because that's not burdensome, it's not that costly. It's a very simple operation. I know doctors will do it. Make a simple incision, place a tube in someone and feed them. So we shouldn't have a fear of, oh, I don't want to be kept alive by tubes. Well, people have this idea, you know, all kinds of tubes running into the body. Well, no, a feeding tube is not like that. A feeding tube administers nutrition, hydration, in a very unburdensome, um, less burdensome way than feeding someone manually. And like I say, people can gain their ability back to swallow. So um, food and water, even by artificial means, a feeding tube, are not medical care. They're considered basic human care. Must always be administered to patients unless death is in Or the body's not benefiting from it. Sometimes the body shuts down. You don't keep feeding someone if the, if the food and nutrition is not uh, uh, keeping the person, benefiting the person. There are cases where this happens. That's usually your death, a day or two away. It's immoral to starve someone to death, even if they are in an apparently permanent comatose state. We're going to get to that a little later okay, in a few minutes. And here's a quote from Pope John Paul II, now a saint, as of last Sunday, Sunday before last. He says, the administration of food, water and food, even when provided by artificial means, for example, too, always represents a natural means of preserving life, not a medical act. When death by starvation is the direct outcome of their withdrawal, it becomes euthanasia by omission. 
and the deliberate killing of human, a human person. That's an address to physicians in 2004. And uh, the Gospel of Life, Evangelium Vitae, is an encyclical by Pope John Paul II. He okay. wrote it back in, I think it was 94. You know, he deals with this in number 65 of, of his uh, encyclical, Evangelium Vitae is the Gospel of Life. Has any of you ever read it in your, in your former classes? Have you, have you looked it over okay? So, mm -hmm. I've, I've quoted from it a little bit in previous things I've said in class. Okay? So, he talks about uh, euthanasia is, is, is murder. You can't, you can't do this. Okay? Uh, that's basic rule number four. Euthanasia it means happy death. Okay? It's always forbidden. Uh, euthanasia, and this is a quote from the Declaration on Euthanasia from the Sacred Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith back in 1980. Euthanasia is an act or a mission, a failure to act, which of itself or by intention causes death in order that all suffering may be eliminated. Now to intentionally cause death to another, even to relieve pain and suffering, is really an act of murder. If done to ourselves, it's an act of suicide. You can't say, I'm, I'm refusing to the water for myself. You can't do that. You can't kill yourself. That's suicide. Uh, I, I have in parentheses uh, uh, a reminder to myself, okay, here's a case where, um, a real life case. A former parishioner called me and said, I have the power of attorney <coughs> in regard to my mother, who has Alzheimer's. And my brothers and sisters, or brother and sister, I forget who it was, were recommending that we not give our mother a pill, a medicine that she needs to balance her whatever, her, her, her bodily functions, okay? And without this pill, she would die. This pill was important. Sometimes people need special medicines, you know, for, to keep their heart going or whatever. And uh, because their mother has had Alzheimer's, or has Alzheimer's, this was a couple of years ago, say about, uh, about two or three years ago, um, some of the children were just saying, well, just, you know, mom isn't able to function, remember us anymore, you know, so just let's let her die. And, and I said, well, no, you can't. This is not a burdensome procedure, not even a medical procedure, to give someone a pill that will help maintain their, their, their body functioning in order that they may live. You're obligated to do this. There is no undue burden here. There's no cost here. There's, there's you know, Weigh the costs and benefits. You know, this is not a new burden. So, so she made that decision. And um, her mother, her mother's still alive. This is two, three years later. And um, you know, it would have been wrong to just say, well, we're not going to give her a pill. Oh, because she has Alzheimer's. Well, just because someone has Alzheimer's doesn't mean that we allow them to die. But this is being done. Places where people are at now, people get a severe case of Alzheimer's. Uh, they're, they're allowed to to not be fed or hydrated, and um, this, is, this is murder from from a Christian Catholic perspective. Now, sometimes, you know, a person with Alzheimer's may lose the ability to swallow. But that happens. And what happens if if you have to then try to feed them by a tube? And they keep pulling it out. Uh, sometimes people with Alzheimer's they just don't understand this. But you do what you can, but then you say, "Well, we, we really can't do anything for this person." Okay. I mean, you try your best to do something, and if, if it becomes almost extremely burdensome, impossible to, to feed them, even by by a tube, and you can say, "Well, we're doing all we can, but we try anyway." So. Um, And under Rule 4, the second paragraph, an act which causes death to someone or ourselves would be a lethal injection. 
Uh, have you heard of Dr. Kevorkian? He was doing this for years. He's died. He was called Dr. Death. He promoted what we call, what was called the, the right to die movement uh, in this country. And Dr. Kevorkian was, he administered lethal injections to people. He went to prison for it. We can't administer a lethal injection. That's active euthanasia, it's called. It's an act of murder. I'm suffering, so put me out of my suffering. Now, we can do that with animals, but we don't do it with human beings. There's a meaning to suffering. We're going to get to that in a minute. Or an omission, a failure to act, would be to withhold or withdraw food or water from the feeding tube. Nancy Cousin's case. Does anyone know about Nancy Cousin? Uh, well, we'll deal with it with our next topic on the sheep and earth. The so-called persistent vegetative state, PBS. That's what it's commonly called. Uh, but first of all, we are human beings made in the image and likeness of God. We are not vegetables. I don't like that term, persistent vegetative state. Someone is a human person, whether they can speak or not, whether they can respond or not. We don't call them, oh, the person's a vegetable. No. Actually, as, as I'll, I'll make clear in a minute, uh, these individuals can often hear what we're saying, even though they can't respond. And sometimes they can make responses to us. Um, so, it's better to re refer to such persons as being in a locked state. You know, you're, in, you're in kind of a, or, or, a semi-comatose state. Or comatose state. Okay. Uh, there are many report, reported cases of people coming out of so-called persistent vegetative state after months or even years. They couldn't respond. And all of a sudden, they, they're able to talk. And... Um, especially when people continue to communicate with them. When people when people show love to them okay, and, and empathize with them and talk with them, that, that talking and communicating with them, it uh, helps bring people out of, of that state sometimes. And we cannot withdraw food and water from them. Now, Nancy Cruzan, anyone ever heard of Nancy Cruzan? She, this was a famous case. Michelle, what are you writing? Please, just read my sheet, okay? It's not a time to do the war or communicate by letter or something, okay? This is important material, okay? But you have to know, as Catholics, because you may be in a position someday to make a decision about something. You have to do the right thing. Uh, Nancy Cruzan was in what, what people call the persistent vegetative state, the Latin state. However, she was able, as people testified in court, to look at people when they came in the room. She smiled at people, relatives, when they, they said hello to her sometimes. Okay? Um, she was able to hear, obviously, okay? and, and take in things, even though she wasn't able to speak, she wasn't able to communicate. Her husband okay, took her to court, took the case to court, and won through a judge the ability to withdraw uh, feeding and, and hydrating from her. And she died. Well, uh, this, this, is, this is wrong. And um, researchers, I, I put at the bottom here, bottom paragraph. In fact, I'll let, I'll let someone read it. Nick, why don't you read the bottom paragraph on the PBS. Researchers from Cambridge University, UK, uh, have been able to communicate with marine injured patients in locked states. We predict such patients will soon be able to communicate and perhaps even move themselves around in motorized vehicles. Dr. Adrian Owen and colleagues use electro is yeah, that's a, that's a long word. Electroencephalography. Uh, monitors connected to electrodes in a tap place on the heads of brain injured patients who are able to understand responses from them. Dr. Owen hopes to apply a similar system to allow such patients to control a motorized wheelchair. So, they're able to get responses from people 
in this in these locked-in states, and hopefully even to have them just by their brain somehow to move a motorized vehicle, uh, like a wheelchair, to, to get around. So uh, we don't want to just say, let's starve these people to death. They're, they're vegetables. No, we don't, we don't do that. Now, uh, here we come to an issue which we can show light and guidance to the world. The value of human suffering, its meaning from a Christian perspective. Now, the whole issue of so-called mercy killing it takes in the problem of human suffering. And oftentimes this is people are may have a good intention. I want to release someone of, of extreme suffering. Okay? So put them out of their misery and their life. Uh, but for a Christian, human suffering, it is a mystery. And we can't fully comprehend it. Even so, Christians see meaning and value in human suffering through Christ. Christ redeemed us through human suffering. And there is, um, well, I like to, to picture this, okay? A triangle, okay? Um, love and sin and suffering. Basically, what I say in my, my sheet there, okay? There's a, there's a link between these three things. Jesus Christ, because of our sins, out of love for us, suffered for us. He gave meaning to human suffering. He transformed the meaning of human suffering, turning it from a physical evil. It is a physical evil. It's not a moral evil. If someone has cancer, that's not a moral evil. No one has committed an immoral act, an evil act upon someone who's suffering from cancer or, or someone who's got MS. Father Reese, who's with me as a priest, he has uh, ALS, Gehrig's disease, and he has lost the ability to communicate now uh, orally. He can't comprehend it. He, can, he has a voice box, but he can't uh, communicate with you. So, um, he sees this as embracing the cross of Christ. God has willed this for whatever reason. Uh, Jesus turned suffering into the greatest good. He redeemed us. Our redemption came through suffering. Now, I'll ask the question here. Why do you think, in God's plan for redemption and salvation, he decided that Three churches of the Trinity decided that the Son should become man and suffer and death. This is why. To see how bad he, um, he wants to achieve. Um, well, how, how much he loves us, in other words. Yeah. Okay? He loves us this much, as, as we would say in the Old Testament. Jesus could have redeemed us because he was God with. The suffering he endured and the blood he shed at his circumcision, eight days old. That was painful. His blood, because it was the blood of God, which could have redeemed all people. But God didn't choose that act of pain and suffering. He chose the cross, the most horrible suffering, the most horrible way to die, probably in any age. Uh, the Roman historians have noted that. that um, that there is nothing more, more, more gruesome, more, more horrible than to, to suffer crucifixion. Our Lord did, did this for us, out of love for us. So, uh, this is part of the mystery of, of the cross. God willed to send his son to suffer. Suffering and death were the punishments for sin. Remember, Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. There was to be no suffering. There was to be no death. God used the punishments for sin, suffering and death, to redeem us from sin. That's God's plan. Who would have thought? The devil didn't understand this. That's why he was encouraging the people to put Jesus to death. So, um, this shows, as I say at the top of page two, okay, 
turn that over. Okay. In God's plan, there was a mysterious link between sin, suffering, and love, agape love. We're not talking about uh, eros, the love of a man and a woman. We're not talking about philia, uh, the love between the brother and sister, brotherly love. We're talking about agape, the sacrificial love, self-giving love that's willing to suffer for others. All true authentic love, Christian love, is suffering love. We have to suffer. I tell people this when they're preparing for marriage. We're going to have to suffer with each other. Once, once people start living together, uh, the, their, their foibles and their, their little idiosyncrasies and everything else, it becomes magnified. And we have to learn to live and, and forgive. And people cause each other pain. Who causes us the most pain? It's the people we live with. I find it very easy to love the people in China. I don't have to live with them. They don't get on my nerves. Uh, question. Um, so if you don't suffer on earth, then you can't go to heaven? Okay. Well, suffering is, our, is part of our lot. Okay. I, I, down a few lines, I quote Jesus. What does Jesus say? You must take up your cross every day. Every day we encounter adulations, little obstacles to our plans, and people get on our nerves. We have to bear our crosses. Some people are doing bigger crosses than others. Father Luis has asked me, you know, why did this happen? Yes, God permitted it for some reason. And Father Luis said to me, uh, he, he said this a number of times, you know, as a priest, you know, most cases of Lou Gehrig's disease begin with the outer extremities. First, you, you have trouble uh, walking, your motor skills, arms and legs. And finally, after a couple of years, it will go into other parts of the body. With his, about 10% of the cases, it began in the mouth. Why, as a priest, did God allow this to happen? God has a plan. So he's, he's yeah. Well, didn't he um, pray for the Pope or something, and like he wanted to offer up sacrifice for the Pope? Well, actually, he's offering sacrifices for the Pope, but a lot of people would also. He was praying, if it's God's will, he continues to ask people to pray for a miraculous healing through the intercession of a Pope that I quoted earlier on, Pius XII, who's not a saint yet. He needs a couple of miracles to be a saint. He needs a miracle to be beatified and a miracle to be a saint. So Father Reese is asking people to pray for the heavenly intercession of Pius XII, who's the Pope. And if a miracle should take place, then he could submit that as, as a, mir a miracle for his cause of beatification. So um, that's fine to do. But that hasn't happened yet, and he's just having to accept the fact that what God wills that, that I have this, this incurable disease that is deadly. And in a couple of years, you know, without some special treatment uh, that will help to cure this, he's, he's going to die. He knows that. So we're all going to die, but it's not something we all look forward to, especially if you die so to speak, before your time. That's why it's more tragic if a young person dies. You know, someone, you know, some person who's in, say, in the high school here dies in an automobile accident, you know, that's much more sad than if someone, you know, eight years old gets in a car accident and dies. It's like, well, they're at the end of their life, but a young person who had their whole life ahead of them, yeah. So, back to suffering. Okay, the second full paragraph, uh, the first full paragraph on page two, you could read that cake by Christian baptism. <clears throat> by Christian baptism, we become members of Christ's mystical body, the church, and therefore become sharers, cooperators in his redeeming work. One way we become co redeemers with Christ is through unity and suffering with his. Pope John Paul II, in his, in his apostolic letter and human suffering, teaches us that every man has his own share in redemption. Each one is also called to share in that suffering of Christ. So, so God in his plan, he has suffering for each of us. Each of us is going to have to suffer something. Some will suffer more than others. We believe that God always gives us the grace to get through any suffering, any cross he gives to us. That makes sense. God wouldn't give us a cross 
unless he gives us the grace to bear the cross. So what I tell people that if someone has a greater cross, that means they have a greater capacity to love. We can give them more grace in order to bear their suffering. And if we offer up our suffering, um, that's the next paragraph, our suffering takes on redemptive value. It can repair, atone for our sins, the sins of others, if we choose to unite it with Christ's suffering on the cross. Out of love for others. Love for God and others. And we, like Jesus, motivated by love, can transform our human suffering, turning it from a physical evil into a spiritual good of infinite value to make up for our sins and the sins of others here on earth or in purgatory. We can offer up our sufferings for the souls in purgatory. Help them get to heaven. We call it indulgences. Beautiful teaching. This means we can help merit eternal salvation for others, ourselves, and others as well. Are you familiar with Our Lady's the revelations at Fatima in Portugal. Our Lady appeared to three little children, and she appeared for, for six months, telling them to pray the rosary every day, to offer up penance and do sacrifices for sinners. In July, the July 13th appearance, she showed them a vision of hell. And she, the, the children saw hell. She said, look where the, so many poor sinners go because there's no one to pray and make sacrifices for them. We can pray and make sacrifices for sinners. They turn from their evil way, repent, and come back into God's grace. We can do that. God will give them an extraordinary shot of grace that they ordinarily wouldn't receive if we offer it up for them. That's where our suffering comes in. Yes. Do we offer it up for the people in hell or for the people on earth? People in hell are there eternally. They're, they're beyond hell. Nothing can be done for people in hell. Once someone is in hell, that is eternal. Only in purgatory. Purgatory, it's, it's temporal punishment. It's only for a certain period, a length of time. And um, we can help them shorten their length of suffering to atone for their sins. So, um, and this all takes place through Christ. As I say here, as members, baptized members of Christ's mystical body. That's what it means to be a member of Christ's body of church. That we can share in this redeeming work of Christ. We share in the communion of the saints, the communion, the spiritual exchange that takes place via prayer, good works, and suffering of all the souls of Christ's mystical body in heaven, on earth, and purgatory. And this is why St. Paul could say, Claire, read for us, okay, nice and loud, because I'm recording this, your voice will be on, the, on my recording here, okay? I rejoice in my suffering. St. Paul says, I'm making up for what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church, by my own suffering. St. Paul went through a lot of suffering, preaching the gospel. That helped to work toward the conversion of the people he was preaching toward, who were pagans. Okay? This is why St. Peter teaches, okay, we should, Allie, read for us. Rejoice to the extent that you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice and will be. We should rejoice when we suffer. Thank God for the cross that he's given us. Okay? Jesus tells us we must take up our cross daily. St. Paul says if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. And sometimes, like I say, the cross is really, it's, it's really difficult. I'll just, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to tell a little story here. There's a man named John Downs, who I met, he's died since. John Downs, when he was 16, he was a gymnast. He was on the, the rings, you know what those are. Okay? He was doing a flip, he fell, landed on his head, became a quadriplegic. You know what that means? Couldn't move arms and legs. Okay? He was very bitter at God for years and years as a young person. Just angry at God. Why did you do this to me? Why did you let this happen to me? Finally, he learned to accept it. And he went from anger at God and rejecting God and asking why did he allow this to thanking God for his cross. He said, I realize, I know 
now through, through uniting my suffering with Christ crucified, you can do this because Christ was God, his suffering can, can transcend and pass through time and place. We can unite our suffering with Christ's suffering on the cross today. He's able to work so much good through his suffering. I heard him give a personal testimony to this. So, wonderful things that, that can happen by God's grace if we accept suffering. Now, the next paragraph, when and where does this offering up of our suffering with Christ's suffering take place? At the Mass. Every day, throughout the world, the same sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary is perpetuated in an unbloody manner on the altar at Mass. When the priest repeats the words, this is my body and my blood, the Eucharist, body and blood of Jesus, is made really substantially present. And then, at every Mass, Amy, read for us, at every Mass, the grace of Christ merited by his suffering and death on Calvary are applied poured out on the world and all people. If we offer up our suffering to Jesus every day at the sacrifice of the Mass, Jesus unites our suffering to his own. He takes all the graces that we have earned and merited through our suffering and applies these graces for the good of ourselves and for others. Okay. So, this is what happens at Mass. Even if we're not at Mass, physically, we can unite our sufferings with, with Christ at the masses being offered throughout the world. They are every day. And Christ takes our suffering and then applies the merits throughout, throughout the world to help sinners convert, to help the gospel be proclaimed to people who are don't know Jesus Christ, all kinds of good things. And we can do this especially through a prayer. That's the prayer I have here printed. It's called the Morning Offering Prayer. And it goes like this, O oh Jesus, through the immaculate heart of Mary, I offer you my prayers, works, joys, and sufferings, especially, of this day, in union with the holy sacrifice of the Mass throughout the world. I offer them for all the intentions of your sacred heart, the salvation of souls, reparation for sin, reunion of all Christians. I offer them for the intentions of our bishops, all the apostles in prayer, and in particular for those recommended by the Holy Father this month. Now, um, every month, uh, the Pope has intentions that he asks people to pray for and unite suffering for. And this is uh, a little pamphlet, uh, Prayer Intentions for the Pope. It actually has the morning offering on it. There are two versions. The bottom one is the one I gave you. It's the better one. But this month of May, for example, okay, the Pope has two intentions. One, that the media may be instruments in the service of truth and peace. And then a special intention, Mary's guidance, that Mary may guide the church and proclaim Christ to all the nations. Um, if anyone would like, uh, I'll just leave these out here if you want to take one. Okay? I only have about five left. Um, if you want to take one, pray that in the morning. Now that's, I put it on your sheets. It takes about 20 seconds to pray the morning offering. You sanctify your day. You're offering everything at the beginning of the day. All your prayers, all yeah, your words. And then, and Taylor Rudd, and Matthew Knapp, please report to the main.